Hello, and welcome to the live Printing Impressions webinar, Marrying Finishing Equipment with High-Speed Digital Printing for Higher Throughput and Savings, sponsored by MBO America. I'm Mark Michelson, Editor-in-Chief of Printing Impressions and the host of today's event. Before we get started, let me take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with a wrench on it. You can always click this widget for more information. All right, so let's move on to today's topic. What happens when a printing company invests in a high-speed inkjet web press but doesn't have the finishing capabilities to match? One answer is to install a compatible web-fed finishing line that can keep up with rated press speeds. Direct Mail Printer Design Distributors, based in Deer Park, New York, did just that after investing in an HP T240 HD page-wide web press. It acquired a high-speed web-fed finishing line capable of running single or multiple up products. The new MBO finishing line eliminated the need for three older finishing lines, reduced operator headcount requirements, boosted binding throughput by 50%, and increased format flexibility compared to design distributors' older shell production model. Our speakers today include Anna Maverick, President of Design Distributors, and Lance Martin, VP of National Accounts at MBO America. As part of their presentations, we'll address the benefits of transforming to a white paper in digital printing workflow that eliminates the need for pre-printed shells, how customer demands for shorter runs, personalization, and quicker turnarounds are driving the offset to digital printing migration, and productivity gains that can be achieved using web widths of 22 and a half inches and inline buckle folding. We'll also have time for a Q&A session at the end of the formal presentation, so please be sure to submit any questions you may have during the course of today's webinar. First off, though, I'd like to briefly highlight a few key findings of a recent NAPCO media research study on production inkjet printing adoption, which was sponsored by SGIA. You can download the complete study at piworld.com and then by clicking on the Resources tab. One of the survey questions asked, what technology changes, if any, survey respondents made the first time they took delivery of a production inkjet press? And as you can see in the diagram, direct mail printers indicated that finishing by far resulted in the most workflow changes. Only publication printers of magazines, books, and catalogs came in second in terms of how their first inkjet press installation required new finishing technology and workflow changes. And here's a diagram that averages out the respondents by all print market segments. You can see that finishing led the list in comparison to other parts of printers' businesses. So today's webinar topic on finishing in the high-speed inkjet printing environment is quite timely. Okay, Lance, I'll turn the program over to you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, I'll give you just a little brief intro on MBO and then uh, turn it over to Adam to talk about design distributors. Uh, MBO had the pleasure to start quite some time ago speaking with design distributors about the finishing side of their business. and. Um, uh, we had a chance to analyze a more of a shell type working environment where we're using a lot of offset uh, going to digital and uh, how do we finish that uh, better with less people and, and such in, in today's market. Um, before I get too deep into things, I'd like to just take a moment to talk a little bit about the MBO group because I find in most of these opportunities people don't know exactly that MBO is a web uh, finishing producer uh, along with our core business of sheet folding. So I'll take a minute here just to review the company just a little bit before I turn it over to Adam. Uh, the MBO group is a $50 million company and we're held um, privately still and one of the biggest sections of the business, uh, up almost 50% of the business is MBO America. Uh, and our primary uh, market right now is the direct mail business and the offset business and then uh, die cutting and pharmaceutical. And I'll show you that in just a moment, uh, how that splits up. Uh, the Herzog and Hyman product line is actually owned by MBO. So it is a, it's a brand ownership and it's part of our, our repertoire. And interestingly enough, uh, Pharmaceutical folders and their products can also be set into a, uh, um, a web environment. Uh, 
uh, MBO's main headquartered in Germany, and its main factory is in Portugal. Uh, we have about a quarter of a million square feet uh, full service of metal in and, and uh, machinery out in the Portugal uh, facility. Uh, and then one of our big pushes over the last few years has been to partner ourselves up with people that do very well into the digital and the uh, folding world, finishing world, because we've realized over time that we can't do every single operation internally. And it, it's a much better solution to partner with people that have uh, the ultimate expertise in their market. A couple of key points I'll go over real briefly. Uh, the one I'll just point out the most is in 2007 and 8, we made some major changes to the business. Uh, we went away, uh, not away, we added to uh, the business model uh, of folding, which you see we started back in the 60s and uh, continued on in America in the 80s. And we added web finishing in 08, and we added die cutting in 07, which is uh, quite a departure from our traditional a core business of sheet folding, uh, but uh, as you will see today, it, it does play out well where we are using our equipment on the MBO side and feeding it with a web. Uh, and you can see that the partnerships started in 2016 and the new advances we'll be putting out last year and this year uh, will continue in that uh, finishing side, the digital finishing side. Our motto is very much to be a modular company. Uh, we, we understand that uh, most of the projects that are very successful start thinking about what you have to finish uh, from the back end, and you, you usually work on these things from the back end forward. Uh, that way you, you get a good look at what you have to do in the whole workflow process. Uh, it, it's usually not a great uh, method to try and, and force the old method into a new system uh, and just try to replicate exactly what you are doing. Uh, we find that that tends to be a very difficult solution. So uh, coming up with the, the new solution of going, trying to get where you're going first uh, seems to be a good method. Uh, we, we believe that the, the best how for that is to use modularity, uh, flexibility, durability, performance, and, and try to make good partnerships. And what that ends up being for us is you will see uh, is a company that produces a lot of modules uh, that do specific functions that all can be integrated together. And these markets that I mentioned earlier, what we see now, why uh, we believe we have been um, uh, having a much greater impact on some of these markets than before, is that the quality of the digital uh, press, uh, the printed pages, that quality has come way up. And the commercial printers, uh, the direct marketers, the marketing companies themselves and such are, uh, are using digital print more than they ever have. They're using the data more than they ever have. And these two markets are joining together a little bit. So we, we see that our market, which we're very accustomed to having commercial printers uh, that are typically offset printers and high quality uh, sheet fed and web printers, uh, migrating into the finish into digital print, uh, and they need finishing solutions that are more commercial in nature uh, for the general commercial printer. Uh, and it's not not necessarily just a transactional type of an environment uh, where a lot of the the older digital technology actually grew up. And uh, last little bit of information about us is to kind of. Um, give you a better picture of what our market looks like. We see right at last year we had 46% of everything we did uh, was actually in the digital web business. It had something to do with uh, continuous web digital finishing. And uh, the commercial folding, which is what a lot of people know MBO for, was 27% of the business. Uh, that would mean things like B1 sheet size, B2 sheet size, uh, offset, um, and uh, general commercial print folding from a sheet fed environment. And you'll notice here another, what we, we think is a, is a very big growing piece of the business is that uh, yellow band, the die cutting section. Uh, as the inkjet products move farther into these commercial environments requiring die cutting and the sheets get bigger, volumes go up, 
uh, we've had a, a tremendous success with the rotary die cutting side of our business. That's kind of a little look at where we see the, the print market going and uh, how uh, we can be effective in it. We had the opportunity to work with uh, Adam and design distributors over the last couple of years. Uh, and we, we believe this was a, a great case study showing uh, really the complete cycle of working with not only the press side of the business, but make sure that the finishing side of the business was, was changed also to, to match their, their goals for the new business. And what the key was is we, we, for us it was going from an offset shell environment to this white paper digital flow. And uh, I think with that, we'll take a few slides for Adam to describe his business a little, and then at the end, we'll get into the meat of the, uh, uh, of the actual solution itself. Adam? Thank you, Lance, and uh, thank you, Mark. Um, welcome to all the participants. I really do appreciate you taking the time. I know your time is valuable, and for you to take it to spend with us is, uh, is, uh, is, is very important to us. Um, let's talk a little bit about design distributors. Uh, we're a, a full-service direct marketing company located in, on Long Island in New York. We're a direct marketing and uh, mailing company. We like to think of ourselves as having a state-of-the-art facility uh, and have achieved probably one of the most diverse printing and mailing operations in, in this area. We were founded in 1966 uh, by my father and my uncle as a, an envelope company, and then uh, I came aboard in '93 and expanded into slowly but surely into uh, full-service direct mail, expanding from envelopes into non-heat-set web, sheet-fed, and then uh, and then data processing, imaging, and mailing. Uh, we specialize in uh, in assisting our cu customers as they navigate and execute uh, each campaign. Uh, We are committed to uh, innovation and investing in new technologies. Uh, that has enabled us to push, uh, push to the cutting edge. Uh, we, our response to most of our, uh, our clients are, you know, you think of something and uh, we can do it. And that seems to be the way we have approached uh, most of the new programs uh, that have come across from uh, uh, plow folding and opening and gluing, closing, reading, writing, QR codes, automation. And uh, so we're looking at things a bit differently than most other people do. We look at it from the standpoint of we can do it. Uh, we pride ourselves on our ability to execute just about anything that you can come up with, including scented forms. So we're, uh, we're making uh, smelly forms right now. Um, today our offerings include printing, database management, data processing, personalization on a variety of levels, mailing, fulfillment, tracking, and, uh, and reporting. Uh, I'm a true believer in you get out what you put into uh, this industry. I've spent my life uh, in this business, and uh, I spend a lot of time working with a variety of uh, industry organizations, such as the PCC, uh, the APC, uh, and the Printing Industries itself, PIA, and uh, that's Printing Industries Alliance, and the Printing Industries of America. Um, we like to think ourselves think of ourselves uh, as the as your full service uh, direct mail partner when we speak to our prospects and our clients. And as I mentioned, that includes an offering of web offset, sheet fed, and digital, a variety of personalization, including monochrome and color, inkjet and toner based systems, data, ma data management and data processing, which has uh, taken leaps in, uh, in growth over the past uh, couple of years with uh, options and automation that we've included in our arsenal. Obviously, mailing, lick them, stick them, stuff them, and mail them. That's, we still uh, put out a fair amount of pieces on a daily basis. And we've introduced five years ago the fulfillment component of our business. Most of our clients uh, that are producing mailings used to ask us to manage their programs to a mail date. And now we have changed that uh, paradigm to include mailing to an uh, mailing to and managing a program to an in-home date. So with a logistics arm that we've uh, that we put together, we can now uh, effectively manage the piece from not only from inception into mail but into the uh, into the home of the recipient as well. Uh, a lot of you have uh, 
a lot of you who are experiencing the wonderful world of, uh, of compliance issues, uh, the company uh, design distributors, uh, we are SOC 2 Type 2 compliant with a high trust mapping component for HIPAA compliance, and we're FSC certified. So why the shift to digital? Uh, direct mail is still thriving. Uh, it's still a strong performer when compared to other marketing channels. We've seen a couple of slides indicating that, and I've got a little further information to show you as well, that uh, response by selected media, when one looks at the basic channels that, uh, you know, with the larger channel, direct mail, email, paid, cer uh, paid search, online and social, our response rates continue to be higher. Our ability to uh, select the ideal recipient remains strong compared to other, uh, other, other media. Um, we know that when we combine direct mail and digital, offering an omni-channel solution, we can increase the ROI, return on investment significantly. One takes a peek at direct mail, there's more attention, more spending, and higher conversions. The availability of information and the speed of getting that information to the right person at the right time is driving the success of most of our programs that we're producing for our clients. So as I had mentioned, uh, it's an investment. Uh, in fact, it's uh, probably one of the largest investments I've made in my career, uh, a combination of, of inkjet technology as well as toner technology, the IT infrastructure, and, uh, and finishing lines. Uh, it took us the better part of a year, highly concentrated in our team from six to eight months uh, of exhaustive extensive research and the um, the machine we picked, the system we, uh, we partnered with, was HP and the 240, and that came in last July. Um, I do have to tell you, I've installed a lot of equipment in my life. When, uh, when this sucker hit the door, uh, it was truly amazing. Uh, every person from a person who swept the floor to a person who drove the truck, all, all were excited to see this technology and all excited to see where the future of this business was going, at least uh, you know, that's, that's the way we felt. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, besides the inkjet system, we also upgraded and modernized our fleet of, uh, of toner systems. And the reason why we modernized the equipment and went towards inkjets, some of the reasons are a decreased startup, increased quality levels, obviously the increased ability for color personalization, uh, faster turnover. Clients have embraced the new gamut of digital information uh, available to improve their ROI and quicken response rates. And obviously, as part of Mark's, uh, Mark's introduction, uh, now I'm producing a lot more material uh, off of the imaging systems. I have to cut and fold it, um, add a variety of attachments to that equipment to finish the work before I can get it inside an envelope, and if it's a self-mailer, score fold and glue it. Uh, and after another extensive amount of, uh, of searching, we went with MBO. And uh, primarily, well, there's a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the speed, the system that we went with uh, the, uh, is a 500 foot, 500 feet per, uh, <coughs> uh, 500 foot system. Uh, we're on a daily basis, basis running between, and since we put it on the floor, have been running between four and 500 feet. Uh, I'm running that equipment from a roll to a finished product with a single person with a matter of automation at the end of it uh, compared to a buckle folder, having a person feed it and have one to two people picking up. Obviously, one of the major issues before all of us who are in business today is our increased labor cost. And by being more efficient, we're taking labor out of a product and uh, being able to produce more product, uh, more product on, uh, on an hourly basis. There's less, time, less downtime on this new equipment. Uh, it is incredibly efficient. Uh, when we put that machine on the floor, MBO has a program of uh, come, install, train, 
then they leave and then they come back a period later. So they give you a, time, a period of time for you to, to work with the system. Then they come back and enhance and tweak what you've been doing. Um, straighten out any issues with uh, maintenance and how things are set up on the equipment. One of the other things about MBO is that their geographic location, they're located in the New Jersey area on the East Coast. They have a plethora of, of parts for us, uh, easy access to availability. We're located in New York. As I had mentioned, space is a premium. Uh, my facility, when I moved in here in 1993, I thought I was going to be having to sublet space out. And at this point, if we plug a toaster oven over in, we'll, we're going to blow a, a, a fuse somewhere. Uh, we are very limited on space. Uh, and the space requirement of the new system is a, uh, is a much smaller footprint than we are our traditional equipment. We're easily, uh, it was easily hooked up utilizing existing power and HVAC. And we were, uh, we were actually running the equipment uh, before we were completely trained. We were li had live jobs running on it. We have an increased uh, flexibility with this system. Our old, uh, our old Speedos and our Bowie cutters were 18-inch wide machines. We opted for a 30-inch wide system. That gives us room to grow. The HP system is a 22-inch wide uh, max roll width. So that allows us to uh, handle up to, if we're using 8.5-11s, for example, uh, we could run, uh, we could run on a generic piece, three across as opposed to two across. That's a 50% increase in, in throughput. Uh, currently, if we run narrower programs, right now we're running monarch size uh, letters, seven by tens, we're going three across, and we can only go two across prior. You take a look at the old equipment versus the new equipment, going from 100 feet per minute up to four to 500 is obviously a significant increase. Um, we are taking down a three to one equipment replacement, and we're going to, uh, on labor three to two. So there's a significant reduction in labor, uh, a, a significant reduction in equipment, and a 50% increase in throughput. As Lance had mentioned, uh, we were a traditional shop, and we still are. We are still running a couple of webs, UV webs, that, uh, that are producing roll-to-roll -roll forms and putting them through monochrome high-speed lasers. But as we move forward with technology, we will find that there is a variety of things that, uh, that do occur when you start to bring inkjet digital into your, into your facility. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we can do is uh, still print shells and inkjet monochrome. So we get the throughput of the inkjet system at a monochrome price, which is a lot less money uh, than cons on consumables and a lot faster than going with our, con our traditional continuous equipment. So our original workflow, um, very simple. We used to print a form, then we'd image it, and then put it on a bindery system. Uh, our clients uh, would have to give us uh, approvals uh, further upstream than they do now. They can give us last minute approvals. They can make last minute changes. Some of our clients in telecommunications, in, uh, in retail, have uh, are proactive, or uh, I'm sorry, are reactive to their industries and they are act, have, want to change their, their offers, uh, their, their programs uh, very quickly or to hold up less pricing information in the banking business, financial services business to the 11th hour. We now have that ability and we can do it in color. Uh, we no longer have any overs. Uh, we're not pre-printing, you know, six, eight, ten percent overs on forms. We're producing just what we need for the job because the machine. We start with a roll, come off with a finished piece. Also, there's a limit on the traditional on the traditional. Um, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, there is a limit on the traditional equipment where you have a fixed cutoff. For example, uh, we have a 22-inch cutoff. If you'd like to bleed off of 11 inches, if you don't have gap, uh, we have to downsize your forms. So we have to go down to 10 and 5 eighths, 10 and 3 quarters, depending upon what it is. Same thing with 14s and same thing with 17s. Now, if you want a full bleed 11 inch, it's not a problem. If you're looking for a special size, if you want to do a gate-folded piece and you want to just start with a 14 and 3 quarter inch form, I'm not limited in extra waste along the uh, process. So 
That's a Great. little bit about design distributed is what we did in our process. Lance? Yeah, thanks. That's great. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, I think I'll uh, jump right in uh, to a little bit about the specific solution that we analyze. Uh, I hope the audience finds uh, the numbers interesting. Uh, to do that, I will describe a little bit more in detail uh, the shell process just to make sure everybody picks up on what was going on. So I'm going to back up once to this slide here. Um, you will notice in the top picture it was a roll-to-roll -roll, uh, pr process for printing shells on an offset, in an offset environment. Um, and that now that was a that was a fairly fast process, but you'll find out later that there were make ready times uh, and spoilage that came into play here uh, that had a huge impact on the decision. Um, then in the lower picture, you will see some of the older equipment. Uh, I think Adam mentioned the names Bowie and Speedo in the past uh, in, in earlier slides, and they had quite a few of these systems. I don't know the exact count, but it was uh, it was quite a few. Um, and the way that this was normally done, these are fairly slow systems on the scale of things, especially compared to either the offset press or the new HP T240. Uh, these were basically 100, uh, maybe 120 foot per minute machines. And uh, the typical scenario is, is you print on the offset. You take them over and run them through some toner boxes to put on the variable data, and then you come back here and run them through the, uh, the finishing lines here uh, to get them folded. And typically now you're, you're going to have to make a game of, of how many lines of each one are you going to use to keep the, the deadlines moving in the right place. So we came up with a solution to do that based on their major products. The two biggest ones for them were very, very different animals. Uh, you're looking at a letter fold two up, and then they had also this brochure style, uh, newsletter style product that was used making with folders. So you had a, a couple of different major products, and then the, the, the additional items that they had laying on the table to look at were things that were kind of in between here. There are lots of varying sizes. Um, as Adam was saying, they, they wanted to be able to use the full sheet rather than be stuck to an exactly an 11-inch cutoff or a 17-inch, a, a and, and you couldn't bleed anything anymore. You couldn't add a little, little tab or anything. So uh, if you circled the solution around the two major products, what we came up with was a rather modular approach to this where they could print nearly anything they could do in the past but we're just going to feed it with a web, and we're, we're going to increase the production significantly. So I'll go through a couple of the main layouts of what, and then uh, I might be able to still have time to show a quick video of, of one of the layouts running. And then we'll jump into the spreadsheet. So um, first line was, a, in order to do the, le the letter folds, it's a very simple operation for us. Uh, it's an unwind, you sheet, you fold it in the letter, uh, it's very similar to whatever uh, most of the commercial market is used to, and we put it into a stacker. And the stacker is a little bit different than normal. This was a stacker that would stand the product up and, and build up a very slow uh, type of a bundle or a log type of a bundle that the operator could handle easily. Uh, so that was configuration number one. And I'm going to show you this dotted line uh, in the, right at the end of the sheeter. And that line is really what we call the fixed and the movable side of, of the line. So everything on the right side tends to be more fixed. Uh, that's the unwinder and the sheeter. Uh, Adam will have the opportunity to advance to you know, different modules if he wishes. We have plow stations and slitters and uh, angle bar decks and, and dynamic perforators and so on that can all be put in up line. And they are fixed. And you can web through them or you could web around them depending upon the use of the day. Uh, what comes out on the left side of that dotted line is a sheet. Uh, and one of the biggest factors is the sheeter is infinitely variable from uh, all the way from 4 inches all the way up to 80 inches. So we really don't care what the product needs to be. Uh, we can cut it to the proper length uh, and or take the chip out as needed. 
uh, the, the downstream components then need to be able to handle those varying sheet sizes and whatever they are. So they chose to put in a six plate folder, which is a common in the direct mail business, and this stacker. One of the other uh, big newsletter product of those is, uh, is a reconfiguration of the exact same line. You'll notice that the dotted line at the end of the sheeter is still uh, present. We did not move the unwinder or the sheeter in this, this case. All we did is we turned the folders sideways and we reconfigured the stacker. And in that con condition, now he's able to produce an, an eight-page newsletter um, directly from the same web. Uh, this is uh, another variation on exactly that same bundle. You'll notice the unwinder and the sheeter again did not move. The two folders downstream were repositioned. And now he could produce any amount of signatures he wishes for any little booklets or brochure work or, or things like that. Uh, so we gave him a little bit of flexibility, actually quite a bit of flexibility. Gave him a lot of modular growth. Uh, and both the downstream and the upstream side of that dotted line can be added to in the future as they get more and more and more products going uh, in their arsenal. And I think he said uh, in four or five slides ago the choice uh, of going to a 30-inch system uh, is that that did not limit them now, even in the future, should they choose to get even a wider press down the road. So because of the economies of scale, these finishing lines run pretty quick. They can run a lot of jobs through them. So conceivably, you could have multiple presses feeding these lines. And a 30-inch line is certainly not out of the question from uh, the formats that design distributors run. So knowing that, I think I will quickly show a quick video of the line. Um, this is running just a shade under 500 foot a minute, um, with the uh, setup to do the newsletter style form. And you can see it's uh, kind of a, it's, or I'm sorry, it's a letter fold form. So it's using the first configuration of the here. I'll let that play a second. Uh, you can see the form coming off the stacker in the back. It's very comfortable for them to continue this type of speed. Uh, probably could even bump it up as they wish to get up to the point where the, uh, you'd be overrunning the operator. And, uh, and as you can see, the modular is all reconfigurable. As it pans down here, you know, it's got the unwinder and the shooter and you're looking at the folder and the stack. So in the older version now, those Bowie Cheeto lines would be running about a quarter of this speed. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you some of the math that we were always talking about. I think it's good discussion for uh, understanding the ROI just on, just on the cost side of this. Uh, the big items we were looking at was changing the folding rate from um, that 100 foot a minute range up into that four or 500 foot a minute range. And you can see on the top level I had in the original process, uh, the roll to offset portion of that was actually a 500 foot a minute operation. It, it ran nice and quick. Um, the problem was it was a fairly high spoilage and a high cost um, to get that done uh, because of the, uh, there was, a, I believe, Adam, there were three people associated with that. I'm sorry, two people associated with that. And there was quite yes. a bit of spoilage and make ready time on that. Uh, you can see there were 200 minutes associated with a run and 180 minutes actually associated with a make ready. That was the type of press that actually could change its cutoff from those cassettes we showed earlier in the slide. Had 22, 28, and 34 inches, which is the common mail sizes in today. But it comes at a price of 180 minutes per change. Um, the roll to roll print uh, for the toner boxes was the, f the first uh, application of variable data. Now we had only one person on those, but you can see at 125 foot a minute, uh, it cost many minutes to get one box to produce the entire job. So we did this on 100,000 feet of paper, by the way. That's how we came up with the numbers. We had to have some starting point to give us just a, just like a reference point. Uh, the make ready on the toner boxes was low, so we we just we put in 10 minutes because we figured somebody had to load a roll and and 
you know, load the job and do something. Uh, it wasn't instantaneous, but it, compared to the rest of the job, you can see that the make ready on toner was literally negligible. Um, in the roll to fold production, we had a very similar type of analysis to the toner boxes. And you can see that we had only one person per line, but we had a very lengthy time scale. Uh, we had uh, only going through at 140 foot a minute max. And the roll to fold make ready tended to be a little bit longer than what the toner boxes would have been. There was some time. So if you had to change the configuration and such, it, you know, it did take some time there. And we did not discount that time at all, because the system we put in there was still going to use time in the new one to, to change that make ready, because we found that make ready was rather not so appreciable over the whole time scale of the job. Um, so what you can see, uh, we had 1,900 minutes, basically, associated with a labor count of four. Uh, and we had a 10% spoilage on the original paper source. So some fairly significant numbers to take a look at. Uh, the new process, if you look below, uh, the new roll-to-roll -roll digital runs up to 500 foot a minute, uh, which they mostly do. Uh, so you cut the time down for the entire process to 296 minutes total for the printing. And you know, there's no toner, there's no offset and such. And then the roll to fold is a very similar model. We ran the numbers all for them at a very conservative 400 foot a minute. Uh, and we came up with a 250 minute uh, job uh, length and then a 20 minute make ready. So you can see even at the conservative numbers we have there, we've almost cut it by four. Uh, so uh, realistically, it's in the threes. And, and that's, where the, that's where it started to make a whole lot of sense to uh, take a look at this really hard. Um, when you look at what they were really doing, in many cases, you couldn't afford that time change. So we ran another slide. And what you can see is the, uh, th what, the, what really happened to keep the toner production down is they used multiple lines. And that we, I'm pretty sure that's why you see multiple toner lines in most of these facilities is because that part of the process is so much slower than the offset side. You have to run multiple boxes to keep up with the production, or you fall drastically behind. So in reality, you actually had three people running those lines, or, or maybe it was two and a half, or two and two helpers, or something of that nature. But you had more people in that, in that resource. Uh, then on the roll to fold side, you had exactly the same situation. You know, There's no way you could just accept the fact that it's going to run along at 100 foot a minute. You had to get the job out the door. The way to do that is to run multiple lines. So that's why we saw, I believe, Adam, I'm not sure the count, uh, if you remember it. I think it was close to 10, 11, 12 of, the, uh, of those Bowie Speedo lines you have in there? Yes, Bowie, Speedy, and, Spe yeah. Bowie and Speedos, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then now we, um, we would, since we bumped the lines up, we get a little bit of make ready uh, in those. But then also, you're looking at, uh, you, now you're under 1,000 minutes and still comparing that to the line they have now, we're still nearly getting it out twice as fast. It's not quite, but it's getting close. And now you can really see the labor effect. If we can truly continue to possibly replace lines at 3 to 1 or, or hopefully 4 to 1, if we can get the speeds up you know, in some of the jobs, we can cycle jobs at a much faster rate. I mean, letters can run six and 700 foot a minute if we can, we can put the right equipment on and, and channel a line directly for letters. Maybe we can channel a line for the newsletters and segregate out the make readies, and we can really do some, some really nice things in the future. Uh, same type of a light idea you would have with presses. So uh, now you see the labor swing going from eight to three. And that's more where we're really seeing it. Uh, you know, your, your labor impact would be, would be huge. So those, Mark, uh, I think that's about the, all the data we have. Um, we, uh, we'll turn it back over to you to close, I guess, or maybe Great. a question yeah. and answer if we have enough time. Yeah, we, we definitely have some time for Q&A. And, and uh, you know, we encourage uh, all our viewers to, uh, you know, submit any questions you might have. But uh, we have received some. Um, so let me start out. Uh, this one's directed toward you, Adam. Uh, Nancy wanted to know, um, can you print on coded cover on your uh, HP and Jet web press? And what about other stocks? Is that an issue? 
Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, that, that, that could be uh, the subject of an entire webinar. Uh, but the, the quick answer is yes, we can. The HP solution that we did uh, partner with works off of a pre-coder model, which means I can use conventional stocks. I am not limited to treated stocks, inkjet treated stocks. So right off of the bat, uh, there is about a, today, about a 50%, 30 to 50 percent uh, difference in the cost of stocks going with a treated, into a treated, pre-treated stock as opposed to what it costs me to treat it as I'm going into the system. Uh, the other, uh, the other element of that I will have with pre-treating is it does allow me a wider diversity of stocks, so that I can run up to nine point both gloss, matte dull, any coated material, not cast coated material, not like a, an old chrome coat, you know, but any uh, run of the mill, uh, commodity grade coated uh, stock I can run through the system. Uh, this is another question that came in for, for you, Adam. Uh, do you shrink wrap any of the end products, and if so, what equipment do you use? Our shrink wrap equipment lines are Shanklin's. Uh, we have a variety of, uh, of flavors of ice cream of, of the Shanklins, uh, simple hand, uh, you know, hand application of a product on a conveyor. We also have an auto feed system, uh, which could, let's say, uh, you know, high speed batch 20 pieces, drop it into a track, and then feed it into the system as well. Um, and then we have um, a lug-based system where I can put a couple of people at the front end putting a variety of different components in. So if I put four or five people, one person could be putting a pad, one person could be putting a brochure, a folder, and then it accumulates and pushes into the system. Uh, the, 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 uh, the systems are, are relatively simple to operate. Um, and uh, now we, we run, a, like I said, we run a whole variety of them. Okay. Uh, Lance, uh, Randy wants to know is uh, if you can uh, make printed envelopes in line. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, so um, uh, envelopes uh, are an interesting discussion. There are two different types. Um, in our experience, there's the, the standard safety style envelope you get in the, uh, you know, in your no most post office type or postal type mailings, uh, and we don't have the ability to backfold those small flaps on the end. I believe those are called safety envelopes. Um, we can't do that in line. Um, however, the direct mail style of envelope that people see uh, where it's a, a flat-sided envelope with a square corners and glued on the edges, uh, yes, we can. Uh, those are kind of commonly known in the direct mail business. Uh, because they can be folded rather quickly in an inline situation. Just to add to that, uh, Lance, yes, we can produce a side welded seam on the folders. So we are applying a glue left and right and then folding a flap over it. Um, mm -hmm. And then when we go into an angle, um, after that piece is inserted, now when you do use a side welded seam envelope that you've produced, you do have to give yourself a bit more tolerance for the pieces that you're trying to insert. On a traditional die cut envelope, we may have a tolerance of 3 eighths to 1 half of an inch left to right. You pretty much have to increase that, almost double that when it comes to a side welded seam. Um, we need, there's not as much give, so it's a pinch on both sides, so you have to take that into consideration. Uh, but uh, and then also after the fact, uh, the envelope then has to be sealed. Um, with a die cut envelope, there would be a remoist patch, so that would be effectively, uh, you know, a, a moisture applied with a brush. Very simple. When you get into side welded seams, you need to add a, a hot melt system on your inserter, so that after you insert, you're putting it through a hot melt, and then you can then you can seal it. Uh, since we're talking about envelopes, uh, Adam, maybe this is directed toward you. Roger wanted to know what are the options for dynamically produced envelopes. Dynamically produced envelopes. A uh, couple of options uh, changing. The, the the landscape is changing on a you know annual basis. Uh, there are toner systems, which is in essence a a laser that has a path that allows an envelope to be put through it. Uh, 
toner, uh, you, when you're dealing with toner-based systems, you have to be careful because there's an extreme heat element. So if you're using a window envelope, you need to be cognizant of the fact that you are adding heat and you have to use a digitally receptive plastic or digital friendly plastic. Otherwise, when it goes through the heat, it will crinkle and could burn. Uh, there are inkjet systems now that are on, uh, in the marketplace that also you could take a blank envelope or a printed envelope and you can put it through that system. There's a difference in quality, uh, so you've got to take a look at coverage, quality. Uh, anytime you're imaging on an envelope, if you're putting heavy coverage over a seam, uh, any of the side seams or diagonal seams, or even when the flap is, uh, is, is coming across, uh, if you imagine drawing with a pen along a seam, you would, you would, you would, the, the, plan, the pen would move when you got to that seam. That's no different than when you're imaging. When you're using a toner system, you're not only applying heat, then you're fusing, so you're applying pressure. So you have to be cognizant of that as well. However, you know, depending upon the product, got to look at the quality uh, between the two different systems. So yes, the answer is uh, you can produce a dynamically produced envelope. Uh, in most cases, when we do produce a dynamically produced, a color variable envelope, uh, it's a match envelope. So it would be a closed-faced envelope matching to a letter. Uh, the options there are to, when you produce the, when we produce the envelope, we'll put a 2D barcode, apply the 2D barcode to the letter. Our systems will read-read, meaning that it'll read the envelope um, and compare it to the letter, make sure they match prior to insertion. One of the tricks we've done, uh, we've used, is that we'll put that 2D barcode on the outer envelope when we put it in the upper right-hand corner. After we've matched and inserted, we flip it over and we put a stamp right over that barcode so you can't see it. Kind of adds a little more personalization to it and less less direct mail-y, you know, less, less business mail. Great. Uh, Lance, uh, Justin wanted to know, do you, do you see a need for two types of operators when running everything in line? Say, for example, say a graphics person for the digital print side of it and a pressman for the converting aspect. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks. That's that's a that's a great question. Um, I I think there's been numbers of webinars on the inline versus the offline that that that, that question came up, you know, a lot. Uh, we discussed it also with uh, with Adam and and his production people and, and Michael and and such. And yeah, I. The general consensus that I, from you know, in our point of view is if you are if you're doing something incredibly simple like let's say you're always running an eight and a half by eleven sheet and that's all you're producing on the web and the machine's pretty much doing most of its life in that you know eight and a half by eleven eight and a half by fourteen producing sheets and they make it an inline you know you probably have minimal issues with that. Um, the minute you get into something like what we are, we suggested here with design distributors, you really are looking at two different skill sets now. The, the pressman skill set is quite a bit different than the finishing skill set. Uh, so yeah, we, the, the whole idea that you put it all, put, uh, if you put uh, the system that we recommended to design distributors in line with the press, I'm pretty sure that the efficiency of the press would, would be hampered uh, quite a bit. Uh, and and that would not be the right way to go. Adam, Lance, you you're, probably you're have a big opinion on that too. Oh yes, we spent we spent many an hour um, throwing that around, uh, and 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 I think you you nailed it right on the head. Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, you want to be able to the inkjet systems themselves uh, run at an extremely high rate of uptime. They rarely go down, and, and I will attest to that since July. In fact, it, it's, it's shocking compared to the other technologies that we run, the uptime on the inkjet systems. Uh, that being said, uh, what we do here to maximize efficiencies, uh, in, and because of the lack of startup, is that I'll run job A for half a shift or even one shift, and then m migrate to job B and produce what I need to mail for the next day on job B, and then I'll go back to job A. So if I had an inline finishing system, I would have to be shifting that system as well. So we have found that um, to maximize efficiencies, we're running roll to roll, when, and, and we're running that system with a single person right now. So we're going through that 
through that machine, unloading the role, and I could be running multiple jobs during one day, and I can put those on a variety of different finishing equipment, pieces of finishing equipment. The make readies um, out there uh, on the finishing take a lot longer than, than any make ready on the, the inkjet system, because once I've got my settings in place, I can start, stop, change the stock, and hit a button, and, and I'm running. Uh, the other great thing about inkjet is that the consistency from the beginning of the roll to the end of the roll is unbelievable. It, the, the, the registration does not move. The color variation does not, uh, does not waver. Uh, I, I don't have that in my conventional printing area. Uh, there's a lot, more, uh, a lot more things that affect conventional printing. Uh, you know, July in New York and January in New York are two diametrically opposite times of the year and will give you different production, different representations. You know, Lance, you, you obviously uh, visit a lot of uh, printing plants across the country. You know, what kind of difference are you seeing between, say, the offset and the digital world in terms of how they view the cost reduction uh, of their labor, labor pool in, in terms of their uh, capital equipment uh, decisions? Oh. Yeah, I, we, we were talking about this before the seminar started. I, I think that's where you're, what you're suggesting. Um, yeah. So we, we we happen to be at the pleasure of both of those sides of the business, right? We we have our roots uh, back all the way into the '60s for in the offset business and the letter letter press and such. We watched it come up through the through its its uh, paces, and we've been heavily involved since uh, you know '85, just monstrously involved in the offset business. And there's thousands and thousands of folders out there, and now what we see on that side of the business. Uh, is it is a very much rooted in a cost reduction business. It's it, it, most of the time they are putting in, you know, one brand new offset press that takes the place of two or three older ones that don't have automation. Uh, we are doing exactly the same thing on the folder side. You know, the, someone will have seven folders and we'll put in one automated machine that'll take the place of three older ones that you know ran half the speed and so on uh, and you know you, you're, you're always looking at a way to get the job on and off the machine quicker and try to run it as fast as humanly possible and that's that that is a cost reduction model and it's in a very interesting side of the budget so when you're working with those people on that side of the budget that's cost reduction business or cost reduction side of the budget which is budgeted with an asterisk on the side of it right and then on the other side of the equation are things like what we're talking about today, where this is, I mean, I think the, the opportunities that Adam is creating for his company to have over the next, you know, foreseeable future are growth type things. That doesn't have an asterisk on it when it goes into the budget. Those are really well looked at. Uh, that will sustain the business where... Uh, maybe that cost reduction side won't, and it, it might get put on the back burner. So we see a whole different look at way people are looking at these things, and that's why we see a very strong push right now into this digital side, and of course we're seeing it mostly in the web for our business as it moves into this commercial space. Uh, and that, I think that also is signified by the pie chart we put up earlier that showed you know, most of our business now is in that, in that website. Uh, let's move back to the press side. Uh, Anthony, uh, Adam, this would be for you. Anthony wanted to know, what's the selection of inks you use on the uh, on your HP Digital Ink Web Press? Most of the continuous inkjet systems work under CMYK, um, and the there are there is some equipment with a fifth unit or sixth unit. The HP has a fifth unit that they use for bonding agent that enables me to run untreated offset stocks uh, without having to code it. Um, other people use a fifth unit for things like security uh, or mica printing. I have almost seen, I've only seen one manufacturer out there that has even discussed uh, using a fifth unit uh, for PMS colors. The cost in formulating this ink is 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 almost prohibitive, in order to go to the PMS uh, PMS world. But that, of course, opens you up to an entirely different discussion, which pertains to color matching. 
uh, one of the most challenging things in, in dealing with digital printing, whether it's toner or inkjet, is the ability to, uh, to work with branded colors and PMS colors. The first issue right out of the box is that, uh, as I mentioned, you're dealing with CMYK. So there's a different book that we're starting with. We're using a bridge book, which formulates PMS colors in using the, uh, the four primary colors, as opposed to a traditional PMS book, which uses base colors to formulate an exact color. So if you looked at a PMS color of 485 out of a PMS book, and then you looked at a, a PMS representation in the bridge book, just right out of the box, you're looking at something different. Um, and that's, that is a significant challenge when working with process. Now, we're profiling. We're working uh, with Grakel 7. We're working with uh, various certifications. We are tweaking colors. We are running test strips, test batches um, of test, uh, test patterns for a lot of our clients to try to get closer and create special colors where we can. But the gamut is only so great when you're dealing with process, and then it gets reduced even more when you're dealing with inkjet. The color between reflectance and absorption is just different, and it is a challenge. There have been times, and I'll be honest with you, where we are still sticking with conventional, even though there may be a cost savings to go digital on a particular client for a particular program with a specific client because their branding is so important to them this is it they want that PMS color so it is it is a it is a it is a big issue it's something that has been constantly addressed but it's something that one of the advantages we have of still being able to go conventional versus digital you know keeps us uh, keeps us in the right place to provide what the client wants at the end um, Bruce had a question kind of along the same lines. He said, what is the difference in ink cost for each process? Now, I'm not sure if he's talking inkjet to toner to offset, um, so I don't know exactly what he's trying to compare, but um, you know, maybe you can just comment on the ink cost just on the inkjet side even. Well, each barrel of ink averages for HP about eighteen thousand dollars. So, if you're in the ink business, it's yeah, a set of a set of barrels is approximately a hundred thousand dollars. So, or excuse me, eighty-five thousand dollars. It, it's uh, the the consumables are a lot more expensive inkjet versus conventional. We now run comparisons based upon the individual jobs as to which direction we're going, as long as we're not dealing with color variability. Obviously, color variability swings you right over to, to the inkjet systems. Um, where the advantages of one versus the other are uh, is basically uh, on versioning. So if we're going to produce a half a million pieces conventionally, one print version, low color to three color, four color, not even process, and compare that to one version inkjet, it'll still be far more, far more economical to go conventional. However, if you took that same half a million pieces and you ran it in four colors on two sides, and you now threw in three, plate, uh, three print versions, now the dynamic switches. As Lance mentioned, there is a make-ready time. There is make-ready stock. Uh, there is a significant savings uh, being able to migrate that towards digital when you start add, adding versioning. You get an even bigger bang for your buck on the digital side if you can run it together in one zip string. So all of the lots are, in essence, combined in one string. And the only way to do that, of course, is that the rest of your direct mail components are consistent, meaning that if you're using the same outer envelope and the same brochure for the job, but you're going to use a variety of different versioning on the letter, then you now have a postage savings because you're not chunking it up into multiple pre-sorts. It's now one string. You can now take maximization of, uh, of postal share uh, systems like optimization where we can do SCF or NDC deliveries. And that, you know, that's, that's a huge, huge plus on the digital side. Okay, well, unfortunately, that's going to have to be the last question and answer for today because uh, we've uh, just about run out of time. On behalf of Printing Impressions, I want to personally thank Adam and Lance for presenting, to MBO America for sponsoring this educational event, and especially you, our audience, for attending today's webinar. 
Be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all our archived and upcoming webinars. If you would just take a minute to fill out the brief feedback survey that will appear on your screen next, we'd be most grateful. Your feedback will influence the webinars we bring you in the future. Hope to see you all at the next Printing Impressions webinar. Bye now.